Let us listen for words from the prophet Isaiah. All you who are thirsty, come to the water. You who have no money, come, buy food and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money, without price. Why spend your money for what is not bread, your wages for what fails to satisfy? Heed me, and you will eat well. You will delight in rich fare. Bend your ear and come to me. Listen, that you may have life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, in fulfillment of the blessings promised to David. See, I have made of you to be a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the nations. See, you will summon nations you never knew, and nations that never knew you will come hurrying to you for the sake of God, the Holy One of Israel, who will glorify you. Seek me while I may be found. Call upon me while I am near. Let the corrupt abandon their ways, the evil their thoughts. Let them return to God and I will have mercy on them. Return to God for I will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says God. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. For just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to the sower and bread for food, so will my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will carry out my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. And you will go out joyfully and be led out in peace. The mountains and hills before you will break into cries of joy, and all the trees in the countryside will clap their hands. The cypress will grow in place of the thorn bush, the myrtle will replace the briars, and they will stand as a memorial to God, an everlasting sign never to be destroyed. For words of faith in ancient texts, we give thanks. Listen for words of faith in the Gospel of Luke. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse than sinners, worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. On those, or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you can cut it down. For words of challenge and inspiration in scripture. May I speak and may we reflect together in the name of God, the source and the renewer of love. Amen. Today, where I was born, it is War Kuddies Day. That is to say, in Southern English, our Cuthbert's Day. 
The day of the greatest of the so-called Northern Saints, Cuthbert of Lindisfarne. Now, Cuthbert lived back in the seventh century of the Christian era, but his influence lives on strongly, and not just among the people of the northeast of England. Historically, Cuthbert is also the official protector of the north, not least of County Durham, in which I was born. So today, the 20th of March has become County Durham Day, and the flag of the county flies high with its distinctive cross of St. Cuthbert emblazoned on the colours of blue and gold. More significantly for all of us, however, there are aspects of Cuthbert's life which are still life-giving for us, part of that ancient tradition from which all Christians in the mainstream historic churches can draw. And not least, this is in terms of a spirituality which seeks to learn and not just learn, but to be part of the more than human environment of God speaking to us intimately through the land and the seas, through the birds, the animals, and other creatures with which we share them. Because as we hear Jesus' parable of the fig tree today and reflect on our Lenten themes, we are encouraged to recognize the great breach between humanity and God's creation. And with Cuthbert, we are called to return our hearts to the heartbeat of creation itself and to live more kindly in rhythm with it. Before touching further on War Kuddy, let me first, however, reflect on Jesus' words that we heard today and those of the prophet Isaiah. Because what Jesus is saying is very pertinent for us today. It has two parts to it, doesn't it, that reading? The first part, Jesus is clearly responding to those who are seeking meaning out of some horrendous events of their day. Why do bad things happen to good people? We reach for meaning, don't we, when we see disasters. We look to see some pattern or purpose, especially in seemingly pointless destruction. When bad things happen to bad people, or at least people who've caused great injury to others or themselves, we're less concerned. But what about those apparently doing very little harm and sometimes great good to others? What about the deaths of young children or vulnerable people or those who've been greatly sinned against or those who embody great compassion? Where, we cry out, is the rhyme and reason and that question, of course, is one of the major reasons for the loss of conventional faith in God. Jesus typically just does not answer the question. To be honest, I don't think it's answerable in simple human terms. That's a core part of the great book of Job in the Bible, which wrestles above all with unjust and disproportionate suffering some of which we see in our screens every day and we experience in our lives. There is no simple human answer to suffering, but there is still the reality of God. So what Jesus does is to try and switch our attention to ask a different question. Instead of the ultimately useless concern about the whys and wherefores of life and suffering in general, Jesus directs us back to the specific and to our own way of living. No, Jesus says, quite clearly and firmly, so much of our human suffering is not caused by God or some other supposed recorder of good and evil. Terrible things just seem to happen. But how are we ourselves going to live not to worry about death and suffering, but to find ways to live in the presence of God's love. Will we be consumed by fear and fascination about suffering, or will we seek life, seek God, where they can be found? The great English writer Dorothy L. Sayers used to put it this way, Christian faith, she said, does not give us a supernatural explanation for suffering. 
but it does give us a supernatural use for it in the sense of something more, super in Latin, than the obvious and instinctive natural responses by human beings. As in Jesus' day, there are plenty of people inclined to blame others for sufferings, aren't there? For example, it still seems to be a natural thing for poverty or other hardship to be seen as the fault of those who bear it. And we've seen recent attempts, haven't we, by the influential to blame flood and climate-affected populations for living in the wrong place. There's still an assumption by many that living a good life or a religious life should guarantee a longer and safer existence. And that's there in the Gospels in that passage. And meanwhile, wars and other aggressions are sometimes justified by religious people as the logical consequence of various supposed ideas and behaviours that they don't like. And the Bible wrestles with this tendency. It's got all sorts, it is wrestling with this question. And it helps to explain, for example, how judgmental features are sometimes mixed up with more life-giving things in biblical passages, including in parts of the Gospels. Because this book is a fantastic book because it's taking the whole of our experience and wrestling with it in the strength of God. Christians, too, as I've said, are also not immune to reading biblical passages with more judgmental eyes, much as Job's comforters unhelpfully sought to interpret his sufferings as something he'd done rather than realities that had hit him in the face. A classic case of potential misreading scripture must surely be the second part of our gospel reading today, where the parable of the fig tree can be interpreted as being about judgment. In stark contrast, I would suggest that it's actually the opposite. I think the parable of the fig tree is about mercy, about waiting and working with nature, above, super, our instinctive knee-jerk reactions. Because the key thing, I think, often is who we think the man who planted the fig tree was. Are they to be interpreted as God? If you interpret the man who plants the tree as God, then it can easily become a story about judgment. And that's a common line of interpretation among the centuries, and I expect in lots of sermons today. But is there any reason why the man who plants the tree is to be seen as God. Isn't it more likely with others of Jesus' parables that we have here a short version of what might have been a longer and quite possibly interactive conversation? Even if it was shorter, there's no indication that Jesus uh, directs us to see the man as God. Rather, it's just a story into which we can read God and judgment and mercy in different ways. What do you think about that parable? We don't have to make the gardener, the other person in the story, into God either. Although we might reflect that the gardener is actually a very powerful biblical name for the risen Christ. We can just read the story as a story, as Jesus probably intended. And what then jumps out is the gardener's encouragement to mercy, to waiting, tending and working with nature. Yes, he say, seems to say to the planter of the fig tree and to others like him, yes, I understand that you're anxious to get productivity out of your fig tree and for the fig tree to bear fruit. But look more mercifully, wait on nature and work with it. Now, those who know about fig trees say that the gardener's advice makes good agricultural sense too. A feature of fig trees is that they often take years to bear fruit. And there's a Uniting Church minister in the Central Coast Presbytery, for example, who has planted a fig tree, and it's taken six years for this fig tree to blossom and bear fruit. I have to say, they almost gave up as well, but they obviously heard what Jesus was saying. Because like other plants and animals, 
Fig trees have their own life patterns and rhythms and they don't fit a simple box. That might be hard for humans in a hurry to grasp, but it's a reality. So we can try and force the wider environment of which we're a part. We can blame it for not responding as we might like. It rains at the wrong time or whatever. We might even try to use its behavior as a sign of judgment. But that is really what human beings have placed on the wider environment on plants and animals. They're not as fault as such. To draw further consequences for human behavior only makes things worse. Do we see, as with other teachings, remember the one about not hastily ripping out weeds from your garden or your field, Jesus is encouraging us, surely, to a more kindly approach to both human and more than human husbandry. Like a good gardener of the soul, Jesus is asking us to cultivate mercy and patience and to work with nature, and for that matter, our own lives and our own struggles, as our partner, not as our property or our enemy. Stop imposing your own needs for meaning on life, Jesus is saying in the first part of the gospel. And stop imposing your own needs and expectations on other aspects of life, Jesus is saying in the second part. It's interesting always to look at any text in the Bible to see what follows or what comes before it. It's usually quite illustrative. And immediately after this section of the gospel we hear today, Jesus goes on to one of my favorite stories, where he heals a woman who has been crippled for 18 years. Not three years like the fig tree, or six years, but 18 years. Because Jesus' healing is embodying that mercy which was so longed for and which had to be waited for. And it is working with the realities of life. The woman would have been like the fig tree for many people, wouldn't she? Seemingly useless and an embarrassment and a source of judgment. Throw her away, people must have said. It must be her fault. But that is not the way of God in Jesus. Jesus' way follows the similar encouragement from the prophet Isaiah. It's a fantastic reading. In fact, most of the third Isaiah, as they call it, the last parts of Isaiah, is a fantastic book. Seek God, our first reading says, and return to God so mercy shall be shared. For as Jesus was saying in both parts of our gospel today, the prophet says, my thoughts, God's thoughts, nature's thoughts, if you like, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Significantly, the prophet continues with an analogy which expresses God's life and work in terms of the more than human creation. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, Isaiah says, watering the earth and helping it flourish, giving seed and producing bread, that's how the life of God works. Look to nature, to creation, to see how God is working. And in, when you understand that, the prophet says, humans will then go out with joy and be led back in peace. And Isaiah proclaims in what I think is one of the most beautiful biblical expressions of the interrelatedness of God's creation. And I was tempted almost to put this back into song at the end. If we return our hearts to God and God's pathways of mercy and creativity, the mountains and the hills shall burst forth into song. You know, you shall go out with joy, be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills shall clap their hands. That's the invitation of Isaiah if we return our hearts to abundant life with all of creation. This divine ecological pathway brings me back finally to War Kuddy, Cuthbert. For like many of the greatest saints, not least in the Celtic tradition, Cuthbert can never be separated from close intimacy with the rest of God's creation. Almost invariably, Cuthbert's portrayed, every picture almost you see of him, is with birds and animals, especially those of the sea, because he was connected to the islands of northeast England. There are many stories about it, but some of them are quite fanciful. 
But others may be more factual than we think, because we look out from a culture which is so distant from the land, sea, and environment that sometimes we do not realize how close human beings can be and intimately connected. The most famous story of all is that of Cuthbert's encounter with otters, extraordinary creatures. For Cuthbert had a practice, profoundly ascetic and strange, it might seem to many of us today, of standing at night in prayer in the sea. Even on a summer's day, that sea, the North Sea, is very cold. It's said, however, that other monks noticed on at least one occasion that two otters came and wrapped themselves around Cuthbert to give him warmth. Now, as I say, you can regard, regard that story of Cuthbert and the otters as purely imagined. But for me, it runs true with other stories, like those of Francis and the wolf, or St. Hugh and the swan, which at the very least symbolize the deep and intimate relationship between particular humans and aspects of the wider creation in our Christian spiritual tradition, a deep intimacy that we have lost. More recent iterations of Christian faith, it is true, have not exactly restrained the developments of human violence towards God's wider creation, and sometimes Christians might even seem to be cheerleaders for them, as in debates over fossil fuels. But our longer, deeper Christian spiritual traditions speak of very different relationships, and that is what we are reminded when we look back to that ancient heritage. So our readings today, like War Cuddy, to summarize, invite us to repair this breach with God's creation through returning our hearts to God's mercy, God's time and patience and creativity. For our Lenten calling includes allowing the fig tree, the rain and the snow, the mountains and the hills and the otters to speak afresh to us and help us share their own life and rhythms. Indeed, they encourage us like Cuthbert, and I don't recommend standing in the North Sea at any time, <laughs> to stand literally and spiritually within creation itself. And maybe that's an invitation to us today or sometime this week to go and sit, stand, swim, whatever, and just let yourself, not purposely, you know, not to necessarily, but to allow yourself to enter into it. The final concluding image is from the main picture from our liturgy sheet cover. For the bridge at Da Nang in Vietnam offers us a visual pathway in which we may walk together in harmony with God's wider creation. Can you see those hands? They're intended to represent the hands of God. And the walkway is, as it were, the thread of mercy and renewal on which we're invited to journey. Know well, and those who've been there tell me that that's an earlier photo, that now that those hands are now, you know, almost covered in greenery. The hands and the whole become one with the wider environment, where human ingenuity combines in listening and sharing with all that is and allowing that wider life to minister to us, just as the otters did for Cuthbert and the fig tree for the hearers of Jesus. So may we walk that pathway of mercy and creativity and know the comfort of otters and all God's creatures. Amen. <laughs>